our second session here, and uh, used to have as our first speaker Dave Woods from Southampton, who was going to talk to us about designing computational physical experiments for Okay, so thank you very much, Max. Uh, thank you to Peter and Catherine for the invitation uh, to give you a bit of a uh, roller coaster uh, tour today through some of the things that have been talked about during uh, the UQ program on essentially design of experiments. Uh, so I'll give you a bit of a, back, a bit of background, some introduction. I'll try and set up what we mean by a design problem in the UQ context. Um, I'll then give a few examples of design of experiments, problems and applications in uncertainty quantification that I've either worked on or would like to work on. Uh, and then essentially I'm going to go through four or five different research challenges which came out of the program and I'll give you some references to where you can look at where some of these ideas were discussed in much more detail during the, the workshops and seminars that are taking place during the, uh, the, the, the program. Uh, and then we'll have a very brief and uh, quite subjective discussion uh, at the end. Okay, so just to set the scene about design of experiments then, so you can think, or I like to think at least, that experiments are in some sense the gold standard of the scientific method, at least when they're available, and in a physical setting at least, they're used to investigate the impact of some intervention on a process or system through the application of this intervention to a number of different objects or experimental unit. So this process might be a physical process, an agricultural field trial, a clinical trial, an experiment in a chemistry or engineering lab or in a wind tunnel, or it might be a computational process. So it might be numerical implementation of some mathematical model of maybe fluid flow or the interactions between drug and ligands or the dispersion of a chemical or biological agent across uh, some geographical terrain. And the intervention we might be interested in studying might be a drug treatment or a, a control, a placebo. It might be a combination of physical settings in a lab. So a sort of generic teaching example is a chemistry experiment where we can vary temperature and pressure and measure yield. Or in our numerical ex uh, modeling examples, it might be a combination of input and parameter values that we can set for, to run a computer code in which to obtain the calculated uh, output. So in each of these settings, we're going to think about the design of experiments very loosely being the, the active and informed selection of these interventions that are applied, that taking account of multiple sources of uncertainty. So active because we can intervene in the process and decide what interventions should be applied to what units, and informed because we're going to try and do that in a way that actually Tell, gives us as most information in some ill-defined sense as possible about the process or about some features of the process relevant to the scientific questions that we want to answer. So design for UQ, well I've, I've taken the definition of UQ here from the uh, website for the six-month program so if you want to disagree with that it's Peter, Catherine, Max and Henry you can, you can disagree with. So, UQ is a broad phrase, no one's going to disagree with that, uh, used to describe methodology for taking account of uncertainties when mathematical and computational models are used to describe real-world phenomena. So I think I'm going to be focusing on this idea of UQ involving uh, mathematical models which are coming from some scientific process. Okay, so there's some scientific understanding, some mechanistic understanding, that leads to the development of a mathematical model. I'm not really going to talk about how we design experiments or do modeling when we're doing empirical or data-driven modeling. Okay? I think I'm, I'm going to be controversial. I'm going to say I think uncertainty quantification for empirical modeling is statistics. And I think UQ is something quite different from that. So if we're thinking about design of experiments for uncertainty quantification, then this is when active data collection is possible we have the question of what points in our input space should we run a physical trial to obtain actual data, which we can then use to try and 
tune or calibrate the mathematical model that we're interested in. And if our mathematical model is only implemented in, only available to us through a numerical implementation, we also have the question of where should we query the computer model, the numerical implementation of the mathematical model. And this second point is important when our models are very slow to run. Um, so relating back to sort of what Max was talking about, I guess I'm thinking here about being army A and thinking about where we should be querying our numerical approximation. And canonical cases like climate change, these numerical codes, computer models could take days, weeks, months to run. And so thinking about where we query those is quite important. And so the aim of our experiment is usually to answer some scientific question, which we're going to assume we're going to do through some kind of uh, essentially statistical modelling or stochastic modelling involving our mathematical model. We might want to build a surrogate or an emulator for our computer model to try and essentially, as Max was saying, replace this slow running uh, code with something which we can evaluate much faster. In our mathematical model, we may need to learn or estimate unknown parameters in that model. And we might want to provide a predictive model for future responses or events. And there's lots of other aims the experiment might have as well. We might want to test different competing scientific <laughs> theories by choosing between possible mathematical models. So if we start by thinking about physical experiments, so these have been very widely studied for a long time within the statistics community particularly for empirical models or for what I'll call physical models, mathematical models which have a closed form. So where, for example, simple systems of differential equations where we can solve the equations and come up with a closed form. Thinking about how to design experiments there is a well-studied problem. So we have a very incomplete history here. I'm not pretending this is comprehensive. We can go back in time and think about Francis Bacon and the scientific method in the 16th century. James Lind developed the first clinical trials, essentially, or some of the first clinical trials to evaluate, scur uh, to evaluate uh, treatments for scurvy in the Navy in the 18th century. And in the 19th century, Charles Pierce talked about the importance of randomized experiments from a more sort of philosophical point of view. But the sort of formalization of design of experiments as a, uh, a sub-discipline of statistics really started in the 1920s with the agricultural experiments taking place at Rothamsted. And you can sort of see why they worried a lot about data collection there, because you have a limited number of growing seasons within a year where you can actually collect data on, for example, which uh, varieties or a particular crop are going to give you the best yield or be most resistant to pests. And obviously, Fisher uh, was the big sort of proponent of this and developer of a lot of fundamental underpinning methodological work. Then moving forward into the 1940s, we had, in some sense, the first development of the systematic clinical trials. Bradford Hill and MRC funded research on tuberculosis trials. Into the 1950s, and then there's an uptake of how design of experiments are being used in industrial experimentation, with George Box being at the forefront. And also, that's when the pioneering fundamental work on optimal design methods, so thinking if we have a particular, if we know in advance a particular form of our empirical or mathematical model that we wish to estimate, can we tailor our design mathematically to give us the, some, some good or optimal properties in terms of estimating that given model? And so the sort of cl a classic example of a, a design for a physical system would be a factorial or fractional factorial experiment. So this is an example of a fractional factorial experiment where we have 11 variables we are studying, which we've labeled <coughs> x1 up to x11. Our experiment is going to have 12 runs in it, which are the uh, rows of this matrix. And each row tells us, should we run, uh, should we set that factor in that row to its high level, plus 1, or its low level, minus 1. And then a row defines for us a treatment or an intervention in our experiment. So in the first row of this design, all our factors are set to their lowest levels. A two-level design like this is very typically used in early stage experimentation where you're looking to try and understand 
which of these factors really have a, a, a driving effect, a, a really active effect on our, our response. And we're looking there mo mainly to estimate, obviously, a linear trend, because we're only running the experiment at two levels. So if we think about running experiments on computer codes, at least within the statistics community, it was like the 1980s and 1990s, this really started to get going. Uh, people like Jerry Sachs, Henry, who was in the audience, Max Morris, Jeff Wu, started doing a lot of work on how we design and analyze experiments for complex computer codes. And this, I think, is where we get the most direct and first connection through to the applied maths work. And where I'm not qualified to speak about the applied maths stuff, really, so if anyone wants to interrupt and tell me I've got it wrong, please do so. But essentially, I think you can start linking this back to very early work on quadrature back done by Greeks and Babylonians, etc. where you're thinking about where should you evaluate your integrand in order to approximate an integral. And then moving forward into the applied bit, uh, a bit more recently, we have things like sparse grids, which Max talked about, uh, reduced basis methods with the sort of sequential design aspect of which point should you include next, uh, to where to evaluate your PDE, which thankfully Max also talked about. There's also been quite a lot of work for more non-intrusive methods. So if you're doing orthogonal polynomial um, approximation to your uh, computer code, your numerical code, where should you choose, again, to, to run that code to, to estimate the parameters in those models? And perhaps most recently, there's been a, a lot of work in the applied community on how you design experiments for what you might call inverse problems. I would call it perhaps a calibration problem, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Obviously, the names I put next to things are obviously not comprehensive. They're meant to give you an idea. So as an example of a computer experiment, you tend to get very different designs, at least for in the statistics community, for computer experiments as opposed to physical experiments. The big difference, of course, is in a physical experiment, we expect there to be background noise. And so things like replication become very important to try and understand what that background variability is. If we're experimenting on a deterministic computer code or numerical model, then we don't expect there to be any background noise. And so replication is less important. What's more important is to space fill. And the reason being, we expect our models to be relatively complex. We don't think linear trends are necessarily going to describe what's going on. So if we space fill, we give ourselves the ability to fit more complex statistical models to the, the data, the model outputs that we get. So here are three examples of Latin hypercube designs, which are an incredibly popular class of uh, space filling design. They're popular because these are two-dimensional examples. In high dimensions, space filling is very difficult with a finite number of points. Latin hypercubes ensure you space fill on the 1D projection. So if you were to look at how these points project down into either dimension, you would see they are reasonably uniform <coughs> in both dimensions. On the left-hand side, we have a random Latin hypercube. In the middle, we have uh, an orthogonal array-based Latin hypercube. And on the left, a maxi-min Latin hypercube. Essentially, this gives you an idea of the realm of research that can take place even within one field. People have spent a lot of time looking at for good Latin hypercube designs. So in some sense, the middle and the left, uh, sorry, right-hand design are, are better than the first in terms of their 2D space-filling properties. So we can look at some examples now of uh, some applications or potential applications of design of experiments for UQ problems. So we'll start with something for biological science and looking at how these are going to be very brief, by the way, so don't expect many details. Um, there are some references. We'll start with an experiment in biological science where we're looking to study the transport of serine, which is an amino acid, across cell membranes in human placentas. And the dynamics describing this transport are described by a system of nonlinear differential equations, which we can't solve analytically, so we have a computer code to do that for us. And then we have the question of if we want to estimate that this computer code, this computer mathematical model and the computer code implementation of it rely um, on some unknown parameters that we need to estimate from data we collect from experiments. So the question is, which experiment should we run? And we can choose here essentially the starting value of serine outside of the placenta. That's one design variable. 
and we can choose at what time points we attempt to take observations of our system. <coughs> so this gives a demo this the plot here give a demonstration of a possible design here in terms of each of the points here are showing us observation times that we could take. We've actually got two different designs here, uh, the top one and the bottom one, two different possibilities found using different criteria. And the shapes of the curves come from having had different initial starting values. These are the, uh, the expected responses, essentially, from our mathematical model for different starting values of, se of serine external to the membrane. So the sort of research challenge here, which we've, we've got a paper on archive you can have a look at, was how should we pick these initial starting values and the sampling times given this mathematical model that we wanted to estimate. The second example here comes from um, actually a, a KTN uh, UQ study group that I was involved in, where we worked with some engineers from Jaguar on computer experiments to try and look at the ride performance of some of their cars. <coughs> so essentially, as you kind of know, um, car makers have lots of different versions of the same model of car with different refinements, different bells and whistles added to them. And partly at least, these different variants are designed to cater for different markets in the world. So in this particular problem, Jaguar, particular model of car, uh, Jaguar had 10 different versions of this car, and they were interested in, could they, and, sorry, these 10 different versions essentially could be defined by settings of these first four variables, the mass of the car, the weight, the distribution of that mass, its center of gravity, and its roll inertia. Each of the 10 variants had different values of those variables. A variable which could be controlled separately for each of the cars was the pitch inertia, or the damping. And the idea is, could settings be found of pitch inertia which would make the performance of the car uh, robust across the different variants, where performance here was measured by ride characteristics, so how comfortable was the ride in the front of the car compared to the back of the car. Physical tests here would be expensive. You would have to get hold of each of the variants and drive it around some kind of test track. So instead, there's a computer model which describes the performance of the car for given values of these variables. So we were able to do designed experiments on that model, in fact, using Latin hypercubes, not dissimilar to the ones I showed you before. We were able to fit some surrogate models, in this case, a Gaussian process, to get uh, an approximation. And then we were able to look at how can we uh, predict the probability of meeting particular performance constraints for different values of this last uh, variable of pitch inertia. And this plot gives some sort of uh, not terribly uh, exciting uh, results from that, where you can just see that each of the different colored curves here is a, one of our 10 different versions of the cars. And we can see the probability of meeting the constraint for different values of our, uh, da our damping or our pitch inertia, and pitch inertia, which we've obviously scaled here to lie between minus 1 and plus 1. We've done work with GlaxoSmithKline on how you can predict where medicine will, get, will go in the throat, in, for example, from an inhaler for asthma. So here we have uh, mathematical models evaluated using computational fluid dynamics of the, of the throat. And the question is, when you blast your inhaler into your throat, what you don't want to do is have the medicine getting stuck at the back of the throat. It wants to go down into the lungs. And the question is, can are there features of the things that the, uh, the scientists can control about the inhaler, for example, the particle size of the medicine, that can actually be robust to the noise variables which will be going on, such as the angle at which someone will hold their inhaler? That's not controllable, but things like the particle size of the medicine are. So in the computer model they have of this, of course, they can control the environmental variables. They can investigate what will happen. So again, we did some computer experiments. We actually used a different class of design now based upon trying to get good pr model predictions. And we were able to build predictive models, for example, that told us what the deposition would be like, or predicted what the deposition would be like at a particular point in the throat 
uh, with uncertainty intervals uh, corresponding to the fact that obviously we're not able to observe our computational model everywhere. We've only got a limited collection of model runs or, or data. There's the problem of sensor placement. Now this can come either if you're interested in empirical prediction, so where should I put my sensors in some geographical region like the eastern United States in order to predict ozone levels using an empirical model. It could be there's a physical model, a more UQE problem would be to have a physical model underpinning, for example, the dispersion of something across a region. And then the question is, can I combine uh, observations from a set of sensors with the physical model to invert that to find, for example, where the source of this disper dispersed agent or, or whatever is. And there you have the problem of trying to, again, to combine uh, the physical data with an expensive computer model of that dispersion property. And then the final example is one we haven't worked on yet, but we are hoping to. We've been talking to the Bloodhound supersonic car team. So these guys are building a car which they hope will go 1,000 miles an hour, uh, which will comfortably break, break the current land speed record. So that's the car. They designed the car using computational fluid dynamics to try and understand the airflow across that car. Um, so the, all the pictures here come from Ben Evans at Swansea University. Swansea have a long history of providing CFD modeling for land speed uh, record attempts. But we've recently got involved talking to them about what the CFD run should be performed, where should they evaluate this model, where should <coughs> sensors be placed on the car in order to get uh, good and informative measurements of the airflow, airflow and possibly, I'm not, I'm not sure they're going to agree to this, at what speed should we actually run the car and testing when in order to get the data that we want to be most informative. Okay, so that gives you an idea of some of the sorts of application areas where there are designer experiments problems in UQ. And it's not comprehensive by any means, it's a very personal uh, selection. So during the program, we've had a number of workshops, a number of seminars. And what I just want to do now is just go through, I think it's four or five different areas where people have been discussing some either very recent work or some research challenges which uh, exist. And uh, I have um, blatantly stolen stuff from people's slides. I've tried to acknowledge it uh, where I can. So. The first exact thing, the area that people have talked a lot about is, calibra is design for calibration or history matching or, or inverse problems. So this is thinking about where to take these physical observation runs uh, or observations in order to enable precise and accurate parameter estimation or model inversion using these different methods. So the key thing here is if our computer model, our computer code is expensive to evaluate, as well as deciding where to take the physical observations, we need to decide where to run <coughs> the computer model. We're not going to be able to run it wherever we want to. And I should maybe point out the key thing is when we do, if, if, if we were just going to do sort of model based design of experiments, we would potentially have to run the computer model thousands of times in order to find an optimal design. That's why the computer experiment side becomes important. And often in these models we're looking at now, the inputs partition into some physical inputs and some calibration inputs. The physical inputs can be controlled in both the physical experiment and the computer model. The calibration inputs exist in the computer model, but not in reality. And so we need to decide where to design both these experiments. So Angela Dean gave a talk on this back in workshop four. The plot hasn't come out terribly well, but what we've got here is two physical variables, x1, x2, and one calibration input, t1. The physical experiment here is shown by the crosses, which are on the x1, x2 plane. And then the computer experiment is the circles. And they obviously are in the 3D space. You can choose both x1, x2, and a calibration parameter. And in the work that Angela talked about, she looked at how could you do a combined design for these experiments to minimize, uh, in some sense, the, uh, the error between, well, minimize the error in future observations, future predictions, or observ predictions of future observations of your system. 
And one of the key challenges in this area, which I think is still being addressed and dealt with, is how you deal with mismatches or discrepancy between the physical model and reality. We don't expect our physical model to be a perfect description of reality. There could well be systematic differences that we need to learn and try to understand. So there's lots of different applications in subsurface flow, drilling, sensor placement, manufacturing. And I say Angela talks about this in workshop four. Peter also talked about it there. Uh, Sam Jackson should have a, hopefully has a poster on it in um, the session today. And my first uh, advert for the uh, MSG seminars that we're having next week on design of experiments is here. Shwing Han will be coming and talking about some of these problems next Wednesday afternoon. We have an afternoon of seminars on design of experiments here at the Newton Institute if anyone is interested in coming. Second area people have talked a lot about is Bayesian design of experiments. So we want to combine prior information and tailored utility functions to choose the locations of physical observation. This allows us to have a coherent and comprehensive treatment of all sorts of uncertainties, model uncertainty, parameter uncertainty, measurement uncertainty. Compared to Frequentist methods, I think you can argue they are less reliant on asymptotic results. But the trade-off is they tend to be incredibly computationally expensive in order to evaluate the properties of a design. So this plot comes from a, a, a seminar by Joachim Beck, which was given a couple of weeks ago. What we're looking at here are different methods for evaluating the performance of a design against, essentially, what we're, what we're, what we're looking at is the, the error we have in those methods against the amount of work that's performed. So obviously, as the amount of work goes up, the error goes down. Uh, um, and what Joachim was presenting was some different methods, particularly this yellow line, which enables us, him to get much better tolerances for much less work. For example, many less Monte Carlo simulation evaluations when he is uh, evaluating his utility function. This is an area where there is a lot of work going on in both the statistics and applied maths communities. And I think one of the good things about the workshop has been the ability for people from both communities to talk to each other to understand where the challenges are and what each group are doing. Lots of applications again. And people who've talked about things like this in different workshops include Henry in workshop one, Yusuf Marzouk in workshop four, Joachim gave this seminar, and I also gave a seminar back in uh, April or March. I should say, of course, the reason I'm putting these on the thing, on the slides, is that most of these talks are available on the Newton website for you to go and, and see. The third area is Bayesian optimization. So this is thinking about optimizing expensive black box functions using the minimum number of evaluations or experiments if your black box function requires you to actually go and collect data. So here, there's a very natural trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So do we take experimental runs uh, or function evaluations in the computer model case where we're uncertain about the output from the experiments on the model or where our current knowledge, for example, encapsulated in a statistical model, tells us the response is most likely to be optimal. So you can kind of see that trade-off happening here. We fitted a statistical approximation to some function runs. The question is, where should we evaluate it next? In this case, in fact, um, the point where we currently think the maximum is and the most uncertainty is, is kind of similar to each other. So again, we get an obvious point at which to run there. But sometimes those two things will trade off against each other. During the program, people have talked about how to get this on a better decision theoretic basis how to do this in parallel. So it's actually a, a non-trivial problem to do this multiple points at a time rather than <coughs> one point at a time. How to do this for noisy functions or experiments rather than computer models. And how to be non-myopic, how to think several steps ahead in the process rather than a single step. So David Ginsburger talked about this in workshop one. And if anyone was here earlier in the week, then on the M2D workshop, uh, Tim White gave a talk about this. I think the final area I'm going to talk very briefly about is computer experiments. So here, we're thinking about choosing the collection of model runs at which we're going to build our surrogate or our emulator. So as we talked about before, space filling designs are a natural thing to use here. And there's been discussion during the program on how to build 
minimax space filling design. So these are quite complicated. Minimax, you want to minimize the distance between the points in your design and any other point you might want to predict at. And that's a very difficult thing to do. It's about global prediction. Um, you can build approximations to that, and they become very computationally intensive. And there's some, some interesting ideas about how to make that a bit more computationally feasible. People have been talking about what sort of design should you do for stochastic computer models when you have uh, a low signal-to-noise ratio or a varying signal-to-noise ratio. Should you still do space filling? Or for a stochastic model, do you have to have some replication? And the slide here is from Bobby Gramercy's talk in workshop two, where he has, in this case, a two-dimensional response surface coming from a computer model which has variability at stochastic and that variability is varying. And the numbers here are the number of points you would take in your space filling design or your computer experiment at different locations with the contours, the colors being obviously, well, obviously being the different variants, so high variance, low variance. And if you look carefully, most of the high numbers in this plot tend to be in the high variance area. So replications being taken where the computer model is uncertain. And these have applications in disease modeling, pharma modeling, tsunami modeling. So talks by Gramercy, Maria Adamu, Luke Promzato. And next week at MSG, come back and hear Serge Gwilas talk about some of his recent work <laughs> in this area. So I think I'm coming towards the end. I hope I am. Well, I know I am. I hope the time is roughly coming to an end as well. Uh, so a few slides of discussion. Um, so I, I've tried to pick out what I felt were some of the differences and then also some of the similarities between the research in statistical design of experiments and that being done in the applied maths community. So I think traditionally, as I sort of talked about in history, statistics has addressed physical design problems and the applied maths community has addressed computational design problems. Although recently, if you count 30 years or so as being recent, both groups have broadened and are tackling uh, the other problems. Quite often, the two communities either have different quantities of interest or, at the very least, assess the performance differently. So this is something that Peter mentioned at the beginning of the day. Are we looking at, for example, probability statements or ideas of variance and precision against numerical uh, error and error bounds? And of course, within statistics, there are separate research strands on design of experiments and on statistical modeling. And that means that often, for a particular design, a particular modeling problem, there might be a choice of designs that you can use which may be better or worse. My limited experience suggests in the applied maths community, the choice of the design points often seems to be directly determined by the choice of approximation that you're making. So there's not quite the same. Well, they're a bit more, perhaps a little bit more joined up than they sometimes are in statistics. But there are lots of connections and a lot of common ground. So sparse grids and their connection through to space filling designs and also fractional factorial designs, taking subsets of full factorials. Back in the 50s, Kiefer worked on optimal design problems for essentially polynomial models, which are connections through to the points you would choose for various sorts of polynomial expansions. There's the sequential construction of, of designs. Um, Max talks about, about reduced basis methods and how you can choose the next essential run of your computer model to minimize some error. And in uh, statistics, it's a simple criterion for sequential design is to pick your next design point to minimize your variance. And they are very similar things. And obviously, design for inverse problems, nonlinear models, and calibration, that's essentially being done right now by both communities, particularly from a Bayesian perspective. So my last slide uh, is just really a, a comment on, on the dreaded big data. So I don't think big data has lessened the importance of properly designed experiments. When we're dealing with big models, so computational models which are very expensive, as we often are in UQ, then these still require careful computer experiments. It's not possible to run these things everywhere. In lots of applications, physical experimentation is still very expensive, particularly in the physical sciences. What I tend to notice much more in those areas is rather than big data, you get what you might call fat data or wide data. You can still only take a limited number, or still only perform a limited number of 
experiments on your physical system, but you tend to collect a lot more data on each of the, from each of those runs now. So you get lots of observations from each run of your experiment rather than a single run. And of course, it's still important to ensure the data you collect or the data you have can actually answer the question that you're interested in. So I think that modern applications, the sort of things I started the talk out, are presenting a whole bunch of new research challenges for design of experiments, which hopefully can be addressed by both statisticians and applied mathematicians, perhaps working together. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Yeah, I'm going to kind of, so my question, Max, was sort of pointing toward maybe a future INI program, and my question, you might also do the same, perhaps. Um, it seems like there's ties between the experimental design you're talking about and optimization under uncertainty, because you've got the design parameters. Can you say a little bit about that, and how, where has that gone, and is there future work, and, and so on? So, I, I yes. So, I mean, I, I think, for, for example, the Bayesian optimization area is an obvious area where that happens. And depending on the background you're coming from, I view that as a design of experiments problem. An optimization person will view that as an optimization problem. And I, and I think that's another area where if you look, for example, in the machine learning literature, there's a lot of very cool stuff going on there in that area, which we don't necessarily tap into or, or know about. So I think that, you know, that brings in a third wheel or spoke if you want into that. Into and that and machine learning was one of the places that we're, we're running into this with just it seems like wide open on that. So, yeah. okay, thank you. Anyone else? If not, let's thank them. Okay. Thank you.